Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Chief Executive Officer, Mercer Singapore, Kulshan Singh, and Chief Executive Officer, Mercer Consulting South Africa, and Mahrit Skuman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome from Mercer. Before I hand over to my colleague Kulshan, I just want to share this link with Mercer Alexander Forbes. A couple of years ago, Mercer acquired a, a, a big stake in Alexander Forbes as a shareholder, and now we're imparting on this journey of working with Alexander Forbes, bringing career, wealth, and health to the African market. Therefore, it's our pride and joy today to share with you with this Alexander Forbes function on the research that Mercer does on the future of jobs. So nothing further for me, Kulshan. Kulshan, please share with us. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, this is my first time speaking to such a big audience in Africa. Uh, but before that, are you ready for some Indian accent? <laughs> uh, I promise you I can't beat uh, the energy which uh, Mark brings to this session, uh, but I'm here to share with you some insights, just like a consultant would do. Uh, uh, and uh, just a brief background, I run the Mercer business operation in Singapore, have lived in uh, five different countries in the last uh, few years, like last 18 years, I grew up in India though. Uh, but last 18 years, um, five more countries other than India, but most of them in Asia, but have traveled the world working with clients uh, across all continents. So my perspective is uh, pretty global in nature. As you would see, I'm going to share a global study from Mercer with you. Um, at the same time, I'm here to learn uh, what's happening in South Africa, so feel free to ask your questions, uh, make comments on the presentation, and what I'm going to speak. So. Uh, before I get into the slides, uh, a bit of a context, what I'm going to speak about. Uh, we, the word fourth industrial revolution, uh, Mark used a couple of times, I think. This is uh, something which came out of World Economic Forum. That was a couple of years ago uh, when they were working out specifically how the world is going to change and, and very specifically came about a study which is called Future of Work and Future of Jobs, which Mercer as a global uh, professional services firm participated in. So we are very proud that we participated in that research on what the future of jobs, uh, future of work look like uh, when the term fourth industrial revolution came about. So my first, that is the source of information which I'm going to share. And also, Mercer as a global professional services firm uh, met up 300 uh, plus very big organizations across the world, including um, the South Africans. Uh, we asked them questions around what is changing the world and what are the symptoms and what will it lead to in the terms of world of work and jobs. So these are the combination of two studies which I'm going to share. So feel free to stop anytime if you want to ask questions or at the later, we'll leave some time, me and between me and, uh, and Margaret, we are going to handle some questions as well. Okay, let me straight away get on to uh, the context. The context is uh, Mercer's global trend study. As I said, 371 global organizations were studied 13 million employees represented by these companies. Uh, we had nine industries and number of countries which participated um, heavily into this. Um, quickly, um, what is, uh, I think we, we had lots about digitization and I think that was the strongest flavor from the study that digitization is going to affect uh, the world in a very, very big way. Um, but we kind of try to simplify it. What are the two biggest changes in the world? What is causing this change? Uh, we said there are two big changes. One is let's park that which are technology related and the other one I would call which are social related. So let's talk about the technology related. What is the disruption and uh, what it is being caused? Uh, I think we heard a lot about d digitization. I'm going to touch about a little bit on robotics um, um, and also artificial intelligence and machine learning. In fact, last week I was with a very big company 
in Thailand, uh, world's second largest producer of chicken, uh, poultry products, and I firsthand observed robos feeding the birds, the chicken. Uh, I had heard about robos working with human beings. This was the first time I observed how robos could be deployed in feeding the chicken. And what it led to was 5,000 jobs got eliminated in that uh, entire organization. So my first thing is, what is it leading to? It is leading to skills which we all knew about getting redundant. So that's one impact of robotics, artificial intelligence. In fact, a world closer to human resources. Uh, we helped a client develop a program around what is called job description writer. So this job description writer, if you feed in information about what you want in a job, uh, writes a job description for you and also uh, take away any gender bias, feeds in any strategic input you want, everything, and here is your job description ready within a minute. So, and what it did to this entire thing was folks who would write job description, that entire skill which they had suddenly became redundant. Another example of a very big bank in Singapore, um, they implemented a chatbot. Chatbot is answering 80% of questions which employees ask through the ear. So they don't need any human being anymore in their HR back office to be able to answer those questions. There's a chatbot, and only the questions which get into the range of those 20% complexity human beings get in, and in fact, that is also going to be, I think, getting eliminated as artificial intelligence get more intelligent. Um, I think this is, this is how the world of human being uh, is being impacted by these big phenomena. And what have we learned? We have learned a few things. We have learned that, first of all, it's not that jobs will get eliminated. It is the part of the job which anything which artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics can impact will be getting implemented. So each one of you out there, think about it. It's not your job. It's the part of the job which is very routine in nature, which artificial intelligence can crack, will get eliminated. Accountants, we've been observing 50% of the job get, get eliminated in the next five to 10 years. So in the World Economic Forum, we also went on to find then what it is uh, we should be thinking about. And very simple continuum. Uh, one of our team members, Drew, said, if you have skills which range from zero to 10, uh, where zero is purely blue-collared worker, and 10 is NASA rocket science type of stuff, you should be very worried if your skills lie between four to seven. So that is the skill set which is going to get affected and what human beings should be worried about. Uh, 3D printing, uh, we, we've been hearing, I don't know if you see the latest Facebook videos on 3D printing uh, applied in construction industry. Uh, something which took months to make, now they can achieve that in days. Uh, artificial limb industry, such a big social impact. Um, it used to take three months to get artificial limb uh, delivered to the person uh, impacted, now it takes two days. Such a big social impact on somebody who's lost such a big asset of uh, himself or herself. So huge impact, and, but on the impact on the job side, uh, half a million jobs are expected to go because of 3D printing in the next two years in the US. So, so what is it leading to? Uh, the first thing is, it is leading to much more polarized world for some time than we expect. There will be people uh, who will have skills, but not really need it at the moment, and there will be people who will have skills which are really, really needed in the future, and very, very high in demand, and very rare in nature. So I think the, that will cause a very polarized society. And the prediction is the rate of deconstruction of jobs will happen at much faster rate than construction of jobs for the short term. But when you go in the long term, there are number, number of opportunities which will em emerge for human beings to be able to now ride this change and make use of it. So um, key message, polarized world in short term, uh, uh, some unemployment might rise, but a number of opportunities, it is going to uh, emerge. For uh, just a small example, there are 12 million bachelor's degree uh, folks who get into employment market in India every year, which is roughly one-fourth the population of this country, you think, and they are 
currently being organized uh, into the outsourcing industry, so and so forth. So there is a big wave now happening, how they can this entire workforce could be deployed into artificial intelligence, machine learning, so and so forth. So the government is helping, employers are helping, and there are plans already in place. Think about the number of opportunities it will create, but not before the society gets more polarized for some time. So that's a big uh, thing which we got in this study. Let me move on to <coughs> few more uh, data points. What will get affected? I think a lot of you who represent um, industries which are, um, um, which are technical in nature so far, if you see the jobs like office administration, construction, manufacturing, I gave some examples, are going to be heavily impacted. While if you come from a management field, computer, uh, mathematical, architect, engineering, these are the jobs which will be much, much higher in demand. Um, people ask, uh, what are the kind of degrees? If you see Economist released uh, an article last year that uh, what kind of degrees are going to fetch jobs for people who have kids who are going to universities. So the first one appeared for anything which has to do with engineering, mathematical sciences. Then came the business, and then came economics, and then came um, accounting, and then came the social sciences. So that is, that is what Economist is predicting. Let's go on to the next slide, which shows... Um, uh, in a way, you know, the impact of it in a different setup. I think I've spoken to uh, this slide. Very quickly, move on to this, this mega slide which World Economic Forum created, saying, okay, if this is what is going to eliminate it, what the world of future needs. Tell us what are the four or five skills which the world of future actually needs. Uh, if you see, the first one is critical thinking, problem solving. That came up as number one skills. A lot of people come to me and ask for, hey, you see the world, what is that? Uh, our kids should follow which degree the person should be doing. I said, whatever degree the person wants to follow, make sure critical thinking, problem solving is the center of the skill development of the person. That is going to drive success. That is going to tell what is going to be the future like. Creativity, something which has not been done before and will be created now. Um, Communication, to be able to, commute, to communicate with a very diverse world, with energy, with conviction, and finally collaboration, because a lot of problems you will not be able to solve by yourself, but with the help and collaboration of others and the usage of their strengths. So these four skills came up with the World Economic Forum saying, extremely important for the world to develop. And um, since I was in this part of this World Economic Forum discussion, Somebody concluded uh, this slide by saying, okay, so actually the world needs two types of people. One is the fixers, the others are creators. The fixers are like, plumber's job is not going to go away because they are fixing a problem. It might take another dimension. And also, the jobs which will get created in the future will be of great chefs, uh, fashion designers, folks who are creating things which have not been done before. So anything which is in the process area is what is going to be impacted. So fixers, creators should feel happy about it, should look forward to it. Process guys, make sure your skills are developed to adapt to the future. So that's, that's one big uh, on the technology side what we saw. Let me take you to the next part, which is, uh, <clears throat> I think I spoke about this very clearly on what is impacting the, uh, the social side of it. I'll not take all of these uh, what have been uh, written on the slide, but two, the most important one. The, the first one is longevity. If you're born in the UK or Japan today, likelihood that you will live to 100 is 50%. So what does that tell? What, that tells that as the every life expectancy goes increasing, uh, we will all live to much, much higher age levels as we thought. Uh, it might not be necessarily uh, healthier living. The world is getting much, much more complicated. So then the impact on the world of jobs is, if I have to live between a very active lifestyle of working, let's say that's between 55, 56, to still I need to work till 70, 75, what are the jobs I'll be doing? What is that which will be relevant for me? Do I have the skills? Do I have the appetite to renew my skills all the time so that I'm relevant even when I'm at 70? And an implication to the employer, um, how do we take care of that for our workers? In fact, in the study we found out this is the first time the employees are getting worried around what is going to happen to my skills, what is going to happen to my health, what is going to happen to my financial wellness. Will I have enough saving to live by a life 
uh, when I will still need it to work till 70, uh, and what those financial wellness could mean to me. So the other one would be the, the rise of the free agent. I think all of you have heard about the gig economy. A um, lot of examples from the US are coming saying the 40% of the economy would turn into freelancers in the next three to four years' time. And how do you make sure to continue to drive engagement, empowerment in people who really don't work for you? So um, that's, that's a big new social demographic. So longevity, uh, the rise of millennials, gig economy into work is causing the social side of the change. So with, with what is causing to the change, we also studied, now how are the employers reacting? Uh, let's quickly get to it. Here is, here is how the employers are reacting to it. Four big things employers are doing across the world. The first one is growth by design. They have understood the growth is not going to come from uh, very traditional means of organic growth. It is also not going uh, to come from uh, how they had seen in the past uh, last 10 years. The growth is going to come from disinvesting what they don't think is relevant to investing what they think is, re uh, uh, is relevant. So disinvesting will be a very, very big part of growth. The jobs which are not needed, deconstruct them, help workers to get to the level, uh, to the next level, construct new jobs and move on. So growth by design is number one thing employers, big, big employers are thinking about. The second thing is uh, on the employee side. I will combine the two findings, a shift in what we value and a workplace for me. So the employee of the future uh, is looking for two or three things. First big thing is purpose. Do I work in a company where purpose maximization overrides profit maximization? That is going to be a big driver to select my next employer as you see the millennials come to work. The second one is who do I work with and the third one is, which skills do I acquire? And is my organization really interested to develop skills not only for future, not only for today, but for future? Is my employer ready to invest in my health and financial wellness also? So that's the finding on workplace for me, which is purpose, who do I work with, whether my employer is ready to invest in my skills, in my health, and my financial wellness. And finally, the quest for insight. Very interesting story. Um, Last week, we finished some work back in Asia with an employer where we developed an algorithm to suggest who is going to leave within the next three months. This is, this is a study which I did for, the, for a CEO where we used uh, employee engagement satisfaction data, performance data, employee performance, em employee manager performance, employee's business unit performance, and there were various numbers of other variables we, we counted in to come up with an algorithm which we come to the CEO now. Every three, three months we need to go and say, okay, here are your 10 people at risk. What do you want to do about it? Things like those. So data is going to lead to decisions and insights, and that is that is will be the future. And these are the four big things employers are doing. Um, what I'm going to do is just finish this with a key message um, for all of you who represent either an employer or you're thinking like an employee at the moment. Uh, you are responsible for building employee capabilities, not for today, but also for tomorrow. Coming out of this entire fear of, oh, these guys are going to leave, um, why do I invest in this workforce? That thinking has to change. You have to build future for the workforce when they're in with you. Um, employee wellness, health and wealth can be your differentiated employer brand. In fact, after 16 years of doing this study every year, this is the first year we found that employees now getting very worried who's taking off their health and, uh, and financial wellness. Is their employer really participating in it? And that can become your employer brand. And finally, uh, digital capability will your competitive edge. I think we spoke a lot about it. Digital means scale. Digital means ex uh, greater employee experience and customer experience. You cannot be far away from it, and that is going to be the future. So with this, I'm going to hand over to my colleague and Margaret uh, to talk about what this study specifically talked about uh, South Africa and the employers in South Africa. Over to you. Thanks, Gulshan. I, I just need to apologize up front. I'm dyslexic. So just now I'm going to use my microphone to change the slides, and I'm going to talk into the changer. So please, my apologies up front. <laughs> um, let's quickly look at what it means for South Africa. And I want to share a couple of things with you 
you see there it goes. Uh, regarding Africa as well, because what is important is I've been working in Africa for over 20 years, seeing the continent grow, seeing the continent change. And to me, where we stand today is the most exciting thing that can actually happen to us. Everybody is looking at say the world is changing, job losses, but I see this as the single most biggest opportunity for Africa. You'll ask me why. We've got aging world populations in Europe, in the US, okay? We've got youth in Africa and Asia. Where is the future workforce gonna come from? It's gonna come from these markets. So as employers, as government, as, as social contributors, it's our responsibility, like Ulshan said, to develop those skills to pre prepare for the future workforce, which is gonna come from us. In a couple of years, there's gonna be a, 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 a gap of a million or two million cloud developers in the US. They're going to source it from us, not Asia, Kulshan, from us, okay? <laughs> um, just another thing I want to mention, you all know Mpesa, the mobile money in Kenya, the development of Safaricom. Isn't that great? The ability to make people who were previously excluded from the economy in Kenya, to make the economy accessible because of mobile phones. It is some of the single best innovations that I'm seeing is coming out of Africa. We talk vertical farming. They've got a project in Lagos currently, containers. People who are uneducated is actually running vertical farms, taking the product right to the shop in Lagos by the means of mobile phones. Getting messages on their mobile phones to say, water your lettuce, or plant your tomatoes, send us a picture, we inspect it. And they're making people part of the economy via technology. And that's why I say we think differently and we do differently, and it's one of the biggest exciting times for, for um, Africa. Now, Gulshan mentioned to you the growth by design. Now, I don't know if the story is gonna come through in the, in the slides, but I just wanna mention to you, one of the biggest things that we've seen coming through the study, and remember, it's CEOs, it's HROs and it's employee, is there's a definite disconnect. What CEOs are thinking about and they're planning to do, what HR are focusing on, and what employees are actually wanting. So there's definitely a disconnect and we need to think differently on how we're gonna go into the future. But I think what is important is CEOs are currently saying they're gonna redesign their organizations. They're gonna change their organizations. What is changing it? Greater efficiency, we all know that pressure on the PL, increased agility. Mark mentioned that, that exponential change. If we don't, if we don't ready, we're not ready and we can change quickly and agile, we're gonna be left behind. Greater customer intimacy. We all know it, I think the time of, of one solution fits all is over. My favorite saying to people outside of Africa is, don't think what works in the US or in Europe is gonna work in Africa, okay? We need to take it, we need to twig it, we need to customize it, we need to make it our own, to work in our environments. Then, reduced costs, you all know about that one, and increased innovation. If we say increased innovation, don't think an innovation box standing there somewhere in your reception and say, do people drop a message, tell us what's innovation. <laughs> that is not driving innovation. You've gotta live it, you've gotta taste it, you've gotta show it to your people. Um, is there any millennials in this audience? You know why? It's a mindset. What they're asking for is not different to what we, the way we are actually. There's nothing different from that. So just go back and think, why, why, why must I sit in a job for 50 years? I also want to progress, doesn't matter my age because I'm going to live, I'm going to be spiteful and live till I'm 150. I'm going to be part of the workplace till I'm 102, and then at least I want to take some vacation. But I think it's a mindset, so we need to think differently about it. Now, what is the implication of future jobs? 50 in South Africa, 50% of companies are going to change their job evaluation system. How they value jobs. How are they redefining their landscape? 
job architecture, because these people coming in, they want to know what is their jobs, how are you going to measure me, okay, how are you going to evaluate me at the end of the day, and there's an impact on performance management. What's the differentiation in leadership roles? How do you value emerging roles? It's no more gut feel or, yes, because it was 20 years ago, it was on a Patterson level F. It's going to be a Patterson level F again. The world is changing. There's no gut feel. Like Mark's saying, we can't look back. Everything is an open playing field currently for us. What we value, what do we value? Pay disclosure and the transparency. Responsible leadership, and I think responsible is the main word there. It's about the whole of the organization, the whole of the person. It's not about only the bottom line, the purpose. What is the value I bring to the organization? And the one thing that is stunning because it creates work for us is the uncertainty and the volatility. How do we react to that? Now, I think the big shift from 2016 to 2017 is focus on learning to pay an, oppor a pay an opportunity for promotion. Sean mentioned, if people don't have a purpose, they look at the company and they say, well, I'm not going to find my purpose here, they're going to leave. And that will give you that, and it's not a career proposition, it's a compelling career proposition. It's a compelling employee value chain that you must have, or a value proposition. Now, let's look at the forecast of talent, sorry, Talent supply in South Africa. Sufficient oversupply, HR, leadership, administration, IT and technology. Undersupply, core operation, service delivery, logistics and sales. It's a bit different, but I think we're a bit different on where we stand on the curve of maturity. So definitely when CEOs are looking at this, they're saying, where's my skills gaps? And to give you an idea, we're talking about future of jobs. We run a global energy vertical. We've asked the big global companies to say, give us your strategic workforce planning, your business plans for the next 15 years to 20 years. We took all of those business plans, we looked at their growth, we then went to the universities and the educational assistants and we actually looked at what's coming through the universities and we could beg that in 15 years' time, there's going to be a shortage of skills for drilling operators. Okay? So what must companies do now to actually make sure they will have those skills in place in 15 years' time. It's got an effect on your people. So now you look at your learnerships. You actually look at your graduates. How do you develop people? Where must you start interested, to interest people in studying into, into a certain direction? That is the job of the management of these companies. How are you going to sustain it? A shift in what we value. Um, 90% of companies in South Africa plan to make changes to increase transparency of executive pay. Uh, we all know about the social injustices. How are we going to adjust that? How are we going to close those gaps? And what would make a positive impact on your work situation? Leaders who set clear direction, opportunity to get promoted. You're going to ask, you sit here as retirement fund trustees or looking at the well-being of your people. This is the first step for you to look at how do I look at the financial and health well-being of the people if this is the world they're going to change into. What, do we, what changes do we have to make in your environment to support this disruption that's coming through on the jobs? Transparency of pay calculation, more flexible work options. We all know about it, we know about People with children, how do we cater for it? I was very fortunate, I only sat an hour in the traffic this morning. But what are those flexible options to actually make us more efficient? And what are the barriers? Is it the barriers of your own mind? Because I sometimes struggle when the young people say to me they want to work from home. Are they really going to work? So how do you measure? How do you change those measures? Yeah, it's scary. It's scary, and then you phone them every half an hour. How are you with this? Anyway, so yeah, so sometimes it's our own, our own paradigms that's our biggest barrier. Now, what do employees want in South Africa? Additional benefits for high performers, 
clear performance ratings, create team goals to promote, co promote co collaboration, and more regular feedback on performance. You know, the single biggest mistake we made in South Africa on performance management, it's punitive. When do we do performance management? Right before bonus awards, or right before increases. Huh? So we say to the guy, oh, sorry, you actually didn't perform very well this year, so yeah, you're not going to get a great bonus. Okay? So what do they find out of that? I hate performance management. Not I need to improve my performance. Okay? So what is performance management? Performance management is supposed to be a developmental process to influence people to change behavior to better perform. Simple. But now we got... Tick the box, no, 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 sorry guys, 2% increase, 0% bonus. Okay, and now you ask why they hate it. Okay, we like doing stuff like that. And now the best thing is, everybody is changing their performance management because of the ratings. But if you want to measure anything, there must be a consistent scale of how you evaluate people, am I correct? So instead of a one, two, three, four, five, we might have an A, B, C, D, E, F now. Okay? But there must be something, and our employees are telling us they want a clear performance rating. They want to understand, they want to see that they are treated equally. So a bit of a, I don't know, I think this is going to play out a bit. And then we also have the grading that comes into it, linked to it. So in South Africa, we legislate it. So we have to play by the rule, and we must understand we need to cater for our employees. So, what does it mean? What did the employees tell us? Me, 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 me. It's all about me. <laughs> if you have children, huh? those 14-year-olds sitting in front of you, and you're talking to them, and they go on their phones. Huh? And it's all about me. Not buying a house, but knowing somebody who's got a, who's got, who has the house or who have the house so they can go and have the barbecue there. They think differently, but it's about me balancing my work life, caring for my health. And Sean showed it, and it's coming out in our South African statistics, steering my career, and then managing my money. And I think this is where it's showing this link between Mercer and Alexander Forbes. How do we do that? How do we do that globally? How do we do it locally? How do, how do we do it in Africa? And how do we do it for this new workforce who's going to actually work all, everywhere in the world? How do we cater for it? Now, this is quite a catchphrase. Make work work. And that's what they're asking for us. So, so African employees are saying health 45% priority, wealth 33% and career 22%. That's where it's coming. That's where you will understand loyalty programs. They love it. They love it. So number one asks from employees in South Africa is understand my unique interests and skills. Because everybody is bringing something unique. Everybody has got a skill, and how do we make those skills work for us in the workplace? A workplace for me is flexibility. Like I say, I sometimes have a barrier in my own mind about it, even though we're very flexible. But um, people have got different needs. People want to invest in the societies they come from, or the societies they work for, work in. So they want to be part of the social structure. We've seen it now with Mandela Day. We see it a lot of social structures. I look at it and I think, oh, there goes my production. What am I going to show this month again? But what I'm saying to you is employees want to be involved, those communities. And it's all coming through on social media communities, where they want to go and what they want to be part of. What would make you work for one company over another? Employees want more time off. <laughs> okay? I take that in a bit of a smile, but what they're saying is not more time off, they want time to do other things. 
that work-life balance, be invested in their family, have a weekend, okay? A four-day work week, not gonna happen. Additional paid holidays, okay? Paid holiday trips, if they understand what the tax man is gonna take of that one, I think they'll change their minds. Unlimited paid vacation. But this is the stuff that's coming through from employees. I'm not saying it's gonna work. But that's what they're saying. And those are the big ones that's coming out. So it shows you a shift, okay? And what they're gonna ask from the employer regarding fitness facilities, well-being services, financial advice, recreation facilities. That is what's making them tick. So those are the things in the future that we will have to cater for. Use of HR analytics in South Africa. As you know, I, I love statistics, numbers, it makes me excited. So when we look at these numbers in these big databases, we actually look at predictive analytics. We look at tools that can tell you which employee is gonna resign within the next three months. Okay? Isn't that a great value add for HR? Huh? I can prove to the CEO what's my bottom line addition because I stopped that employee from going. So I don't have replacement costs, you know, training costs. But what are those analytics? What are those big data in this gig economy that we have that we actually gonna use to predict what's happening to our workforce? Now there's a mismatch in talent analytics globally, okay? If you see, there you see what is executive saying, what is HR analytics used for? They're not really aligned, and that's where I came from an earlier statement. There's a disconnect, and the sooner we can get a connect between HR finance and the employees, the sooner we will have that, that performing company, we will have that alignment. Now, Companies in South Africa are using the following tools to understand their talent. Personality assessment, cognitive ability assessment, online assessments, virtual assessments, game-based assessments. Now, all of these are just one, one part of it. But I think what is most important for me is how do you measure my potential? Because a lot of these things measure what I can do now, my skills now. But how do I measure potential? How do I unlock that potential out of my employees? And how do I get that innovation in? The most exciting digital thing I have seen recently, and yes, it's a Mercer product, and I'll tell you why, is Mercer Match. It's the gamification of sourcing and selecting employees. 20 minutes, play a game. And it tells you in which career stream you are um, vested in as a person. I can go further. I can take my 10 best sales managers, let them play the game, it comes up with a profile, and I can measure as many people coming out of university as possible to play that same game. It gives me a match. 10 best candidates suited to that profile. And the young people love it because it's a game. Even I can play it. 20 minutes, my measures 1.4 million data points in that game. That is digitization. That is HR using digitization to actually create the future. Now, how do I get to where I want to go? Career stages. What are the expectations of roles I'm interested in? These are the things that employees are asking. Where can I move? How am I doing now? And I think the most important thing is a mind change. You don't always have to move up. You can move vertical. You can move to a business, different business line, it's different learnings. But we all think, oh, no, no, no. It must only be that way. But we don't know what are those other opportunities going elsewhere. But that's what they're asking from the employer, is how are you going to develop me? What makes a distinctive EVP in South Africa? This is what employees are saying, what is HR saying? Um, benefits, definitely, and I'm going to focus on that because that's why we're here, that's why you are here, that is what you look at, is how are you going to assist your companies that you're part of to bring that co compelling EVP to those employees to change the future of work and to keep up with those changes on what you should provide. 
Now, tap into the entire talent pool and focus on tomorrow's skill sets. I think Ulshan spoke about that. Manning, the managing talent in a disrupted world. Only 20% of C-suite executives are confident in the organization's ability to reskill displaced workers. And this is a global statistic. Only 20%. 39% are confident in their ability to redeploy talent internally, and 44% are confident in their ability to fill newly vacant positions with the right external talent. People, this is scary statistics. It's, it's a risk, it's a major risk. If that is the way CEOs are feeling, it's not what the percentage is on there. If you turn those statements around, it's the majority who's saying they won't be able to actually operate going into the future. Now, looking at you, right now, I'm trying to gauge whether the research is better or worse. Okay? Energized employees. Global average, 66%, South Africa, 57%. How do you energize your employees? Employees who are awake and they're passionate about work, they're invested in the company, they're engaged. They put the performance on the table. So how do I challenge, and this is a challenge to all of you, because I don't know how I'm going to energize you, because you all have that conference look Mike was, <laughs> Mike was referring to right now. But how do we energize them? And how do we get the best and the potential out of them? Now, I'm going to skip this slide, want yep. to carry over. But um, thank you, and if there's any questions. Absolutely. Oh, no. You guys have been like really busy. <laughs> um, some interesting questions. Um, some about my sneakers, which I won't get into. <laughs> Here's a really good one. What impact would robotics have on low-skilled, high un unemployment, and strongly unionized country like South Africa? <laughs> what would you say? It will have a big impact. Um, fortunately, where we stand currently with robotics is you need to have a uninterrupted power supply. <laughs> so I think... <laughs> <laughs> no, I think in all fairness, when we look at robotics and automation, it's going to come to Africa. Might not be right now, but any new plants, any new technology is going to come in versus the old way of doing things. So might not have now, and I think that's the challenge where I'm saying, how do we reskill and recharge existing employees into different fields of, of, of um, development. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was a very interesting question about cryptocurrencies, the future of cryptocurrencies. Just a fad that will die out, will it evolve, grow exponentially, take over hard currencies? I just want to add on the side because I think it's interesting. I want to go... Uh, can I maybe make a comment? Please go for it, go for it, go for it. If, I think we've got too much baggage. If I look at the mobile money not kicking off in South Africa really, yes. but it's big in Africa, it's not kicking off in Europe. We've got baggage, we've got a way, we've got a paradigm of how we do business and how we, how we operate with banks. I've got to go and see my banker, you know, that sort of thing. So unless those paradigms actually change, it can in the future, but maybe not right now because we still need to challenge those paradigms. Yeah, Kushan, what do you say? Cryptocurrencies. Well, well uh, sorry, before that, I have a response to the last question, which, which is going on in my mind, and I really want to address that. Uh, just a small example on how robotics will affect uh, blue-collar worker. I, I, um, not a direct example, but something which happened in Singapore uh, last month. So now we have a coffee shop, which is fully uh, robotics controlled. So uh, your serving and the collection of dishes after one has had coffee and breakfast happens through robotics. And the, the, the change is not pushed by robotics per se, the change is pushed by a lack of availability of um, talent, um, a lack of availability of blue collared workers in that country. And that is why the businesses need to up the game and bring robotics in the picture to be able to run their businesses. I think what the, the idea is there will be a driver of change which will lead this to happen, whether it's lack of availability or it is businesses wanted to bring the cost down or the customer wants a different experience or the world is doing and then why are we left behind? There will be a reason for change and don't understand the country context too much to be able to respond to that, but you will see uh, it's not far away. 
Um, I think I don't don't have any more comments to add on the currency after. Yeah, I, I think and just because it's cryptocurrency is something that I study closely, and I think you just have to look at it again. As I was saying to you, um, if the the fact that you've digitized currency, decentralized it, what are the benefits to that? Well, right now, have you any of you ever tried to send money yeah. uh, to another overseas country? There's about 32 movements that take place. There's, <laughs> you know, if you just think about, does it? empower a large enough group of people that a decentralized model, transparent, peer-to-peer, -peer, right, unless these systems change dramatically, unless the, the banking sectors, not just locally, but around the world, start making it simply easier, unless they start innovating, people will slowly start to use the cryptocurrency setup more and more and more, and for now you can use both, but at some point it gets to the tipping point where you actually can't stop its momentum. So I actually think that just from a personal perspective, cryptocurrencies are here to stay. Maybe Bitcoin fails and maybe others do, but blockchain is here for good. And other cryptocurrencies, just remember, they're version one. So if you look at it now and go, ah, that won't do anything, that's your linear brain looking at a very exponentially changing innovation. Uh, two more questions. I'll just uh, grab it from here. Um, why not a four-day work week? Perhaps employees first need to understand that four days work gets four days pay. And the equivalent of benefits for four days equals paid leave. I think that's almost self-explanatory. Self-answering, well played. Um, in SA, who are more focused on preparing the future for the work? SA companies or global companies with an SA presence? <laughs> uh, I think, uh, well, I'm also fortunate to run a global HR strategy network with, with major global companies. And I think global companies are much more prepared and maybe more risk-taking. But I also want to say is I think South African companies are maybe, maybe more socially conscious because of our unemployment, of our youth unemployment, of creating jobs. So there's a bit of a balance for South African companies trying to get that balance of creating jobs and not, you know, um, getting rid of them. So it's it's... Definitely global companies with a South African presence, but um, that's not always right, and the other one is not always right. I think it's your value proposition, like I say, as a company, and where you want to be stand and where you want to be seen, that's going to determine that right of change for you. I think just to uh, add a small point uh, to the question around uh, four days a week, my view is um, <laughs> it's, it's, about, uh, it's not about a four-day week workplace. It's going to be an uh, adaptable workplace mm -hmm. to individuals' need. And that can extend from, uh, I want to work four days a week to a six day week as well. So the workplace needs to adapt to what an individual wants and can deliver best, rather than being a very uh, dogmatic around, oh, now it's four days, but we want, because we want three days of relaxation. I've seen an employer where, uh, in fact, a um, very interesting tool in front of the employer on the internet, um, if the, the empl employee has a 20 day leave, if you bring it down to 15 days of leave, say I only want 15 and don't want 20, what does that five day of leave actually mean? Uh, that can mean cash, that can mean uh, a, a program which a person wants to learn, education, it can mean an overseas trip. So you can be flexible and adaptable to, uh, to person needs. So that is ahead, not necessarily a four day week to me. Guys, thank you very much. You really have been in it. I see there's just a bill. If you see me sitting on my phone, I'm just curating and curating and reading. You can reply to your own questions within the whole slide set. I see there's like already 20 questions pending. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Thank, <laughs> thank you for you. your time. Thank you. That's thank all you we have so time much. for on thank the questions. Front. If you can please give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.